Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Aubrey Tager. If you're watching this video, then you're looking for some answers for an autoimmune condition that you or a loved one might be suffering from. You might have come to my website trying to find out some information. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what autoimmune conditions are and what we can do in order to help this. Now I want to start off by saying that as a chiropractor, I do not treat any autoimmune conditions. We are not looking here for a cure. What we are trying to do is to make sure that your body recovers properly, that we have a full autoimmune recovery program. So we're trying to do whatever we can in order to make sure that your body can heal itself from any kind of disease process that may be out there. What I am trying to do is just give you the proper information and make sure that we know that we can do anything that we can in order to make sure that your body is trying to heal itself in its maximum capacity. If you are under any care of a family physician or any other specialist and you're on any kind of medication, please speak to them about this medication and do not take yourself off of any medication whatsoever uh, without the advice of the doctor who prescribed it. So a little bit more about autoimmune diseases. Have you thought about why you still have symptoms of an autoimmune diseases when your lab tests might be normal? Has your doctor tested something like your thyroid as part of an autoimmune screening? Have you assumed that your doctor has run the full thyroid panel to rule out any kind of diagnosis or any part of autoimmunity as part of their diagnosis? Now, most likely your family doctor, your MD, has only ordered one thyroid test, which is called TSH. Now, TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. And if you're lucky, maybe they ordered a couple more. I often see T4 levels that may be checked uh, by family doctors. But from your MD's perspective, if your TSH is, level is within a very wide uh, normal lab range, say, 0.35 to 5.0, then you're perfectly normal and there's nothing wrong with your thyroid. But this is a huge, huge gap. The optimal or functional level for TSH is 1.8 to 3.0. So please take out a pen and write that down. The optimal level is 1.8 to 3.0 for TSH. So you could still be normal in the medical doctor's eyes, but abnormal for their optimal range. Now it's only when you're in that range above 5.0 that the medical doctor will put you on some form of thyroid hormone such as Synthroid or the genetic uh, level thyroxin. But as I mentioned, in a medical doctor's eyes, your thyroid or TSH is within normal limits when it's between 0.35 and 5.0. So you are totally normal to them. There's nothing wrong with you. In their eyes, this is all in your head and you don't need medication because you don't really have a problem. Now even though you may still have the classic thyroid symptoms, you might have extreme fatigue, your hair may be falling out, etc., you're still normal in their eyes because they haven't run the appropriate tests. Well, you and I both know that you are not normal. If you were, you would not be suffering from the symptoms of an autoimmune disease and we wouldn't be concerned about your thyroid at all. The number one cause of low thyroid, or what we call hypothyroid in the United States, is something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or an autoimmune thyroid. It's an autoimmune condition, and it means that your immune system is attacking your own thyroid or any part of your own body. Now, an auto autoimmune condition happens where your immune system is attacking a part of your body. In this case, we're talking about the thyroid, and most li likely attacking multiple parts of your thyroid gland. I want you to remember that your thyroid controls your body's metabolism. It controls all of it. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, also known as an autoimmune thyroid, is the number one cause of low thyroid in the US. When your immune system is attacking this thyroid and killing it, you don't just have an immune problem, but you have a thyroid problem. Unfortunately, thyroid hormones are gonna do nothing for the autoimmune attack that is going on. You will continue to lose more and more of your thyroid taking these medications. It is a slow, progressive, and downward slide. 
So the problem isn't just your thyroid, it is your immune system. You have an immune system problem and you need to get help in order to get your immune system to heal. Thyroid hormones are not going to help you heal your immune system. Now first of all what I want to do is I want to explain to you that there's two parts to your immune system. There's what we call Th1 and Th2 and they should always be in balance. Kind of like a seesaw or a teeter-totter effect. One should not be higher than the other. If your immune system goes out of balance because of stress, and stress can be physical stress like an accident, emotional stress, divorce, loss of money, or environmental stress, then one of these systems, either Th1 or Th2, will become dominant and this will cause your immune system to attack your own body. There are specific tests that can be run in order to see if you are autoimmune and if one part of your immune system is dominant over the other. Now, the problem with an autoimmune condition is that it doesn't just attack one area of your body. For example, as we're talking about your thyroid, it can attack other areas of your body. It can attack your pancreas, causing diabetes. It can attack your gut, your stomach lining, causing irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's. It can attack your joints, as we see with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, it can even attack things like your liver, causing an autoimmune liver condition. This can really attack your entire body. You need to be tested to see if what you are having is an autoimmune condition and if that's what's causing your thyroid condition. Now, when we're looking at autoimmune treatment, what we are just talking about is hypothyroidism. There has to be a reason why your body is attacking your thyroid. That's what we're going to be talking about right now. Now, there are certain tests that need to be run besides the TSH in order to see uh, what else is going on. We don't just want to run TSH, T3 or T4, but there are specific antibodies that we call TPO and TGB. So when we run these TPO and TGB antibodies, if they are positive, you have an autoimmune thyroid condition. My guess is that your doctor has not run these tests. Now, there are many other tests that need to be run for the thyroid, but these are the two big ones to help determine if you have an autoimmune thyroid condition. And if you're autoimmune, you have to find out why you are autoimmune. Now, remember when I said that there are two parts to your autoimmune system, Th1 and Th2. They need to work in balance. Now, the reason why they might not be working in balance and one might be working harder than the other is it's usually because of something called an antigen. What is an active antigen? Well, this can be a parasite. It can be a virus, a bacteria, a mold, or even a fungi. Now, it can be in the food protein, such as gluten. Gluten is one of the number one or number one of the top uh, food sensitivity problems that we have in North America. So the protein in wheat, barley, and rye is called gluten. We can also see it with casein, which is the milk protein. What ends up happening here is your immune system could become imbalanced because of dysregul dysregulations. It can also be due to dysregulations with regards to uh, hormon hormonal surges and or extreme stress. Blood sugar problems and chronic inflammation or high cortisol levels can also have a, a, a poor um, reaction to your immune system and cause your immune system to run amok. Now, we just talked about the fact that we want to run things like TPO and TGB, but most people know that they're autoimmune just from the fact that they may also be suffering from a current autoimmune conditions such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Sjogren's syndrome, scleroderma, or lupus, or multiple sclerosis. Another way that people know if they're autoimmune is that their symptoms may wax and wane. That means that they're going to get better and they're going to get worse. Symptoms that wax and wane are a sure sign that you are most likely suffering from an autoimmune condition. The third that way that we know if a patient's uh, suffering from an autoimmune condition is that they will come in with a truckload of supplements. So tons of things that they're taking. I've had people bring in so many bottles of different supplements and vitamins that they're taking. In this case, 
what they, the supplements that they may be taking may actually be making them to get worse. Now the fourth thing that we see is maybe their entire life fell apart when they got sick. That's how they may know that they're autoimmune. They've been to 12 or 15 or 20 different doctors and they have a stack of medical records. They might come in with like four or five hundred pages of medical records, all because of an undiagnosed autoimmune condition. They may also develop an autoimmune condition following pregnancy. Usually women who are Th2 dominant in the third trimester and Th1 dominant postpartum. So you see your immune system is there to protect you. When your immune system runs amok, when it's not functioning properly, it starts attacking different parts of your body. And it's important to know that once you realize you have an autoimmune condition, you need to get checked. You need to be able to manage the autoimmune condition. Now what are the triggers with an autoimmune condition? How did I develop this? Well, it's pretty much a genetics and the environment. It's a matter of what came first, the chicken or the egg. We all know that genetically you may be at risk for developing certain problems and or conditions. If you had a family history of things like MS or uh, diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, you might not get those specific diseases, but because you have a parent who was autoimmune, you are now at risk for any autoimmune condition. That can be psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Crohn's, and so on. So if your mom had a thyroid condition, if your grandmother had a thyroid condition, you'll probably have a thyroid condition too, but you can also have any other kind of autoimmune condition because you now have that genetic predisposition to these problems. Now there are many environmental factors. One of them being chemicals, such as things like cigarette smoke. There are over 519 chemicals in a cigarette. Here's just a few of them. TSNA, tobacco specific N nitro as nit nitrosamines. These are known to be some of the biggest carcinogens and a carcinogen is something that causes cancer to be present in smokeless tobacco. So we see this in smokeless tobacco and snuff and also in tobacco smoke. Benzene. Benzene can be found in pesticides and gasoline. It is present in high levels in cigarette smoke and accounts for half of the exposure to all chemical problems that we suffer from. Pesticides are used on our lawns and gardens. When you inhale them, when you take these into your lungs, you can have a very bad reaction as well. Formaldehyde is also a chemical used to present, to present, to prevent or preserve dead bodies. Now when we're preserving dead bodies with formaldehyde, it's going to stop things from degrading. This is responsible for some of the nose, throat, and eye irritation that smokers experience when they're breathing in cigarette smoke. So chemicals in general can trigger an autoimmune response. Like the latest, uh, latest chemical that we've had hit the news, uh, PBA. Now this is called bisphenol A. We see this a lot in a lot of the containers that you may buy, whether it's at Walmart um, or your local drugstore. Uh, just a water container with the plastics that are in it. It's used a lot in plastics and it's extremely bad for thyroid health. It can actually trigger Hashimoto's thyroiditis or an autoimmune thyroid condition. Now, one of the other major problems that we have with regards to autoimmune conditions and specifically with the thyroid is iodine. So if you walk into a health food store and you tell the manager who has no medical background I need something for my thyroid and they give you iodine, more than likely what that's going to do is it's actually going to make your condition worse. Now according to one of the foremost leading authorities and experts and author of the book, Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms Even When My Lab Tests Are Normal, Dr. Tis Karazian, taking iodine is like throwing gasoline on the fire. Iodine is a red hot supplement these days, but if you go in and you're taking it, then this is going to cause a major problem if you have a thyroid problem. It's one of the worst things that you can do. Check your multivitamins. Does it contain iodine? If it does, then just don't take it. There's no reason to take it because it could actually make you worse. Now if it is making you worse, 
there's no reason to continue with it. Now granted, iodine is something that is vital for thyroid function. It's a major cofactor and stimulator for the enzyme TPO. But for a person with Hashimoto's or an autoimmune thyroid condition, for a, a person where their immune system is attacking their own thyroid, supplementing with iodine is literally like throwing gasoline on the fire. Now you'd be amazed at how many people walk into my door with severe thyroid conditions and they're taking a multivitamin, they're taking all these different supplements because they think they're helping themselves, but in reality what they're doing is they're actually making things worse. They're overstimulating or exceeding the met metabolic capacity of their immune system and this is causing a massive fire or attack on the thyroid. Now I know this seems confusing, but the reality is that most health food uh, and store managers really don't have the background or the idea about which testing really needs to be done and how to, to complement that with regards to uh, a Hashimoto's thyroid problem. Now tyrosine is another very popular supplement that we see in a lot of health food stores for people suffering with thyroid problems. And again, when you walk into the health food store and tell the manager that you have a thyroid condition, it might point you in this direction as well. Make sure that you do not take tyrosine without having the proper testing done. It's an integral part of the thyroid hormone production, but supplementing it, with, it has the potential to actually suppress thyroid activity. So there's not a single study out there that shows the ability of tyrosine to increase thyroid hormones even when they're low. The problem is that tyrosine will actually increase adrenal hormones. So these specific hormones that are, res that are released from your adrenal glands called epinephrine and norepinephrine, these are gonna create a wired feeling. They're gonna give you that brain fog, feel that you're flying and, and this could be one of the worst problems that you have for a patient that has hypothyroidism or an autoimmune thyroid condition. It's creating an active stress response by overstimulating the adrenal glands. Prolactin is another hormone uh, made by your pituitary gland and high levels of prolactin suppress TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. Prolactin is balanced by progesterone and dopamine. So when people have a dopamine deficiency or progesterone deficiency, their prolactin levels are going to increase. Now, what that's going to do is you're going to have a decrease in the, in the function of the pituitary's production of thyroid stimulating hormone. This imbalance will show up in your labs, perhaps if you're lucky, as the TSH being low, but not quite out of the reference range. So that's why it's very important to know about these functional tests and the functional levels. Prolactin also suppresses or pushes down luteinizing hormone. And this occurs in women. So prolactin can actually, in excess, can cause infertility. In men, excess prolactin depresses testosterone, so they have low libido. High prolactin can actually cause tumors, which are called prolactinomas. The bottom line is that in excess amounts of prolactin that's caused either by a tumor or some other problem can suppress your thyroid function. One of the other major things that we want to look at is anemia. When you're suffering from any kind of autoimmune thyroid condition, there's a large percentage of people that are anemic as well. Anemia in itself is a deal breaker for nutritional support of any kind, including thyroid, since anemia literally starves your body of oxygen. Oxygen is very important for healing your body. Your brain and your nervous system need two things to survive. It needs fuel and activation. So fuel comes in the form of glucose, and oxygen. So if you're not using enough oxygen, if you're not getting enough of that into your body, your body is actually, specifically your brain, is not going to function. When we hit age 25, every year after that, we lose 1% of our body's ability to utilize oxygen. It's called oxidative phosphorylation. Now when you think of oxidation, you think about your car, or if you're at the beach, you start to get some rusting from the salt. Same thing with your body. Your body actually goes through this oxidation process. So what we want to do is we want to introduce oxygen back into the body. Now it's vital that any clinician that you're going to see addresses 
any kind of potential anemia that is there. It can be due to a variety of reasons and factors, including pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune disease, or B12 anemia, which is a B12 deficiency. Some forms of anemia don't re seem to respond to iron supplements because the red, cells, the red blood cells are breaking down. So when this happens, supplementing with iron is not necessarily going to help. It can actually make the problem worse. Too much iron in the body is actually more toxic than mercury, lead, or other heavy metals. Now, blood sugar level is extremely important. From a medical standpoint, normal blood glucose levels should be in the range of 70 to 120, while a functional or optimal blood sugar glucose level is between 85 and 99. So according to the American Diabetic Association, a blood sugar level reading of 106 to 126 is termed insulin resistance or prediabetes. And anything above a reading of 127 is in fact diabetes. Now granted, those are fasting blood glucose or blood sugar levels and it's important because many times that I see patients, I ask them if they've been fasting and they say no. So you need to do at least a 12 hour fast which means absolutely no food, no juices, nothing at all. Um, anything, if you're drinking any kind of juices, specifically things like orange juice, you're going to cause a spike in your blood sugar level and it's not going to be accurate. Now, supporting your immune system is futile if your blood sugar level is too high or low. A reading below 85 would be termed hypoglycemia, and a reading above 99 would be termed hyperglycemia. This is called dysglycemia and is a stepping stone to diabetes. But what happens when you go to your family doctor and you're still in that range? If you're way up there at 120, they say, well, you're not diabetic yet, so we'll wait until you become diabetic, and then we can put you on some insulin or some other medication. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that we don't get to that point. We want to make sure that we address this becomes a, before it becomes a problem. Hypoglycemia is a condition in which the blood sugar level repeatedly drops too low in response to carbohydrates or foods. So carbohydrates are what's going to cause your body to actually, actually give it energy in order to break that down. And you need insulin to be able to break, bring that into the cell in order to produce energy. Now, refined sugar is a good example of a high carbohydrate food. It can also be going too long without eating because many Americans are skipping breakfast. So if you're not eating the right amount of food throughout the day, you can cause a drop in your blood sugar level. It's important if your blood sugar level is below 85 that you eat every two to three hours. You should have breakfast, a light snack or lunch, and then another snack and then dinner. The snack should usually be something like fruits, nuts, or seeds. Uh, it should be something healthy. You don't want to be taking um, things like chocolate bars in the middle of the afternoon because what that's going to do is that's going to cause a spike in your blood sugar level and then it's going to drop right back down and then you're going to have this exact same problem. Insulin resistance is high blood sugar level but it hasn't reached the point of diabetes yet. It's called pre-diabetes and it's a result of the cells becoming resistant to the insulin so that no glucose or sugar can enter the cell in order to make energy. You need that glucose in order to make energy. It's a vital part of life. The glucose is going to continue to travel in your bloodstream until it's turned into triglycerides for fat storage. So this fuel is extremely important. This is why it's important to also monitor triglycerides as well as glucose. The process of going into fat storage depends on an increase in the amount of energy causing the person to feel tired while they're eating. So when a person is eating a high carbohydrate meal and it's feel, uh, or a high car carbohydrate diet filled with things like pasta, bread, uh, refined sugar, you can't keep your blood sugar level stable because it's going to keep going up. You're going to have these ebbs and flows, these peaks and valleys all the time. If a patient feels sleepy or they crave sugar, after eating, you know that they ate way too many carbohydrates. If you feel sleepy or you have um, after no carbohydrate meal, you're most likely insulin resistance. It is literally impossible to support hypoglycemia or insulin resistance unless you eat a healthy breakfast with ample amounts of protein. You need to eat protein in the morning, not carbohydrates. You need to eat things like eggs, 
uh, a meat such as turkey or chicken sausage. You need to help these in order to help support, you need to eat these in order to help support that blood sugar level and maintain it. Now brain function is extremely important in treating immune function and it's an extremely vital component to treat. The brain controls every single function of your body. The fact that I can actually move my hands or speak or listen to things is all as a result of brain function. Your, your pituitary gland is going to drive your thyroid gland. It releases thyroid stimulating hormone and controls all the other hormones in your body. The part of your brain called the hypothalamus is the actual driver to the pituitary gland. So you have your hypothalamus sending a message to your pituitary gland which in essence is going to send a message to your thyroid gland and run the rest of your body. Our brain needs two things to survive. We need fuel and activation. So we talked about this, fuel and activation. What do we do in our office in order to address this? Well, we use a thing called an oxygen concentrator. And an oxygen concentrator is going to take the oxygen out of the air. It's about 90% oxygen, not like an oxygen canister, but it's going to give that oxygen to the patient. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow them to be able to exercise. We'll do what's called exercise with oxygen therapy. And that allows them to get the oxygen back into their body and replenish the stores that are lost and allow them to heal much faster. If you're 50 years old or older, you've lost 25% of your ability to utilize oxygen. This is what we talked about earlier called oxidative phosphorylation. This is a big fancy term meaning that you're not getting oxygen as well as you did when you were younger. Again, this is why we use exercise and oxygen therapy in our office. Now, secondly, serotonin plays a large factor in brain function. There's a place in your brain called the hypothalamus, and then there's something called the periventricular nucleus. I know these are big fancy $3 words, but it's critical that you know that if you're suffering with a thyroid condition that this is going on. The hypothalamic periventricular nucleus is acted upon by serotonin in the central nervous system, and what it will do is make you have low thyroid stimulating hormone or low TSH. So taking thyroid hormones or antidepressants for these problems is not going to do anything for you. It will most likely make your symptoms worse. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying stop taking your medication. We talked about this in the beginning. That would be practicing medicine without a license. And be, but be aware that this is happening to your body. I want you to be aware because I want you to start asking your medical doctors why you're not take, why are you taking these medications and they're going to look at you like you're crazy, like you have some kind of psychosomatic illness, which means it's all in your head, and the only thing you need is an antidepressant. The biggest influence on serotonin is blood sugar. That's why we just address glucose. It's so vitally important that you're hypoglycemic or insulin resistant or diabetic that you maintain your blood sugar levels. This is why it's so important to be healthy. Don't skip the meals. Quit eating junk food. Every time you're eating junk food, you're literally throwing away at your brain and you're making the problem worse. You're eating away at your brain. Now, by consuming poor junk food filled diet, you're increasing your autoimmune symptoms, such as feeling tired, sluggish, or an inability to lose weight, or cold hands or feet, or insomnia. You will gain weight easily. You will have difficult, infrequent bowel movements. If you're depressed, this may continue to get worse. You might have lack of motivation. You might have morning headaches. The outer third of your eyebrow uh, might start to get thin. You might have some dryness of the skin or scalp. You might have some mental sluggishness, or you're nervous, or you're emotional, or you might even have night sweats. If you have all of these symptoms and your lab tests are normal, then in the eyes of your medical doctor, there's no problem. But remember, those labs need to be within an optimal range. Now, we talked about gluten, how important that is. Gluten is a protein that we found in wheat, barley, or oats. The reason why so many people across the country are gluten sensitive is that we've been eating genetically engineered wheat since the 1940s. 
Our bodies were not made to eat genetically engineered wheat. Our bodies were made to eat natural things. They were not made to eat chemicals. And when we do that, that's exactly what we're doing is we are ingesting chemicals. In order to be healthy, one of the things that you can do is avoid eating gluten. If you're sensitive to gluten, it will cause your immune system to attack your body, whether it's your thyroid, your, jo your joints, your pancreas, whatever it may be. Remember we talked about an active antigen and a while back, a little bit while back, when you have an active antigen, this can be something that is causing your immune system to run amok or to attack. In an autoimmune condition, most likely your T cells are attacking your body and cause your T cells to, and the cause of this can be things like we talked about earlier on, a parasite, a fungi, a yeast, mold, virus, or gluten. It can also be dairy, yeast, soy, or eggs. It can be coffee or corn. So what we want to do is we want to run the appropriate test to make sure that you are not suffering from any of these foods, it's not making you worse, and that there's no cross-reactive food, something where your body thinks it's a different food, but it's not really sure. Usually gluten testing is done in a medical office. Now sensitivity is not done sensitive enough, so you really don't know if you're gluten sensitive. There has yet to be an autoimmune patient that has come into my office that is not gluten sensitive. Almost everybody that has an autoimmune condition is gluten sensitive. Now some of the other things that are really going to help people with autoimmune conditions are things like vitamin D. Vitamin D is going to be essential. You want to be t taking anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 uh, international units. Essential fatty acids are also something that can really help. Your essential fatty acids are extremely important. Um, healthy hormone production, including the production of thyroid, sex hormones, these all depend on essential fatty acids. Now, these are found in fish oils, flaxseed oil, evening primrose oil, and black currant seed oil. The ideal ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids is estimated to be 3 to 1 to 5 to 1. In the average American diet, or standard American diet, it's kind of ironic that the standard American diet's uh, the letters there are sad because it is a sad diet. The ratio is more likely 25 to 1 thanks to diets that are using heavily processed junk foods and vegetable oil. So you need to be eating a well-rounded uh, diet and these have to be high in fish oil based high potency EFA or essential fatty acid supplement if you intend to be healthy. Now how do you know if you have a high quality essential fatty acid? Well, it's not just the price or what you pay for it. You've got to make sure that it's a good product. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, by all means, um, you can come in and show any of the supplements that you have and call our office and we can definitely help you out with that. Your adrenal glands. These are something that are going infections, like parasites. You'd be surprised how many people have parasitic infections. Blood sugar levels, blood sugar regulation, high or low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, insulin resistance diabetes can all cause elevated levels of cortisol. You need to make sure that your blood sugar level is stable. Now don't forget there are three types of blood sugar problems. You have diabetes, you have hypoglycemia, and you have hyperglycemia or insulin resistance. Hypoglycemia is any one where it's dropping low. Hyper or insulin resistance is when it's going to be high. So when you're, when you're suffering from adrenal fatigue, you need to avoid refined sugar, alcohol, and caffeine because these are high stressors to your immune system. And don't think you can get away with eating aspartame or monosodium glutamate, MSG because these are the worst things that you can do for your body. You want to make sure that you're staying with natural products. Now your intestinal flora, gut function is extremely important because 80% of your immune system is in your gut. And if you're not taking care of that, if you don't have enough acid to break down the food and absorb the nutrients out of the food that you're eating, then you're going to have some major problems. Now, when you have 
what's called tight, ju tight junctions. Imagine that your hands come together and it locks. So the food particles aren't able to get out of your gut. But as you start to pull them apart, you have these little tiny gaps here. This is called tight junctions. And as those open up, that's going to lead to leaky gut syndrome. So food can actually break through there. So as that happens, the food actually will get out into the bloodstream and these particles are going to be recognized as foreign invaders. So when they have these foreign invaders or an antigen, as we talked about earlier, that's when your immune system is going to attack. So unfortunately for many of us, especially those with insulin resistance, this response happens almost every time in result of a chronic inflammatory or irritable bowel syndrome. This sets the stage for the development of autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's or other autoimmune problems. So the first step is repairing the gut to remove the foods that are causing a chronic uh, inflammatory response. And we also want to make sure that we are getting enough acid in there in order to break the food down. Now, if you feel that you have any of these symptomatologies that we are talking about, don't just let this go. The main purpose of this is for you to question whether or not you may have an autoimmune condition and if there is anything else that can be done. Don't use medication as a crutch. All medications are going to have side effects. I'm not telling you not to take medication. You may very well need medication. But there may be something else that can help you. So if you are really, really concerned about your health, no one is responsible for your health except for you. You are the one that's responsible for it. So take your health care into your own hands. And whether your doctor says or not, you've got to make sure you know what's best for you. So arm yourself with the right amount of ammunition um, and the right amount of information so that you can feel comfortable about what's going on with you. Now with something as complex as autoimmune conditions or autoimmune diseases, you have to literally grab the bull by the horns and take charge. It's your life, it's your body. What are you gonna do for the next 30 or 40 years if things continue like this? It's up to you. Nobody's gonna care about it more than you will. You need to take action. You need to get the testing done. You need to get a thorough workup. Nothing else is gonna help you with your immune condition other than the proper testing and the right treatment. So when you're ready, when you're fully committed, please give us a call. Our phone number is area code 802-230-4678. Once again, my name is Dr. Aubrey Tager from Get Healthy Vermont, and I really hope that I've answered some of your questions today about autoimmune conditions. And if there's anything that I can do to help, please don't hesitate to call 802-230-4678 or you can send me an email directly. My, my personal email is drtager, D-R-T-A-G-E-R, -E at gethealthyvermont.com. That's all one word spelled out, gethealthyvermont.com. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.